You're given two shoe covers for your feet before you enter the room so that you don't damage the floor. There's a couple steps you have to go up to a little bit of a, something of a platform before there's this open doorway on the left with darkness coming out of it. You probably don't know where I am, but I'm in the Milwaukee Art Museum. One of the uh, repeat exhibits, something that, they've, they've re that has reappeared there, um, I think last September, is an interactive art exhibit room made by Stanley Landsman all the way back in 1968, and it's called the Walk-In Infinity Chamber. And it uses two-way mirrors, hence the, the booties you got to put on your feet. The mirrors are on the floor, the mirrors are on the walls, and the two-way mirrors are on the ceiling. And with 6,000 lights, you step into the walk-in infinity room. Prepare for infinity. It's, it's, it's a pitch black room. It's, it's not much larger than your elevator, but when you enter it, it looks like you've been plopped into the middle of space with an endless sea of stars surrounding you. In fact, you're almost hesitant to take your first step on the room because you can't quite see where the floor is. It's just space. I want you to go into that room. Well, you can do that literally, but go into that room in your mind as we think about prayer today. Prayer in its most basic and simple definition is what? Speaking to God. Three words. Speaking to God. It's a softball toss in the title today. Just kind of threw it out there. Speak to God in prayer. All right, it's a really easy, easy part of it. But that hardly begins to, to enumerate or, or give you time to think about all that is involved when we pray. So let's go into the infinity room and let's think about prayer. Stand and see yourself gazing at an endless number of lights. And you can look and you can get close to the wall and it's just a really cool illusion. It just goes and it goes and it goes and it goes. And you can, you can begin to think about your God. God whom the highest heavens cannot contain. God who holds the universe, we, the, we, the universe in his hands, let alone the world that we sing about. And not only that, but fathom it. How many, like infinite, infinite to us anyway, bits of information, how many details of everyday life is God managing and controlling and aware of and using and working each and every single day? God is exercising authority over Satan's next thought and your heart's next sigh caring for you. 360,000 people are born today. And God understood the circumstances and, and managed and arranged and blessed that and all of those pregnancies. 150,000 people will die today. I mean, you sit there and can you even like start to count them? It would take me more than 24 hours to even count them in a day, let alone to hold them in my hand and care for them fittingly and rightly as only God could. This just boggles the mind, doesn't it? Aren't you overwhelmed when you stand in the infinity room and you think about God? But God enters the room. And he doesn't do it just like a museum rep might, making sure you're not stomping on the floor. He doesn't just stand softly and sit quietly in the back and let you ponder the abstract art. Your maker enters the infinity room. The one who orders it, the one in whom all of these tiny, endless bits of details and lights that you see are bound together. He holds them. In him alone is their meaning and sense and purpose. This God who comes into this little infinity chamber with you is the one who does and can do more than you could ever ask or imagine and get this prayer speaks to him 
We could talk about prayer from a variety of angles. We could talk about it in its practice in our lives, and it's good. Those are valuable conversations to think about, encouraging each other, repenting together of our self-discipline or lack thereof, scheduling and routines, how to make prayer more regular and habitual in our hearts and lives. We could talk about the persistence of prayer and the attitude that comes along with it. But today, and with the story of Abraham, we start at the core. We look at what prayer is, what makes it such a magnificent gift from God. Why is prayer so important to God and therefore so important to us? And we, we look at that question, what it is, before we look at all the things that we want to make it more in our life, look at what it is so that we might speak to God in prayer, prompted by faith and aware of its power. Be Abraham and go into that infinity chamber and gaze at the infinite that surrounds you. Be Abraham for a moment as God steps in there, but he doesn't step in quiet. You understand that there's a backdrop before God says anything about Sodom and Gomorrah and the coming destruction to Abraham. Abraham has, has a lot firing. He has a lot to say. He has a lot to say about God because God has said a lot to him. There's a faith that has been built up there is an education he has received from the Lord. So the Lord has not been quiet in the infinity chamber with Abraham. He's been teaching him, leading him, sharing with him his mind. This is how I work. These might be a chaotic mass of information and stars before you, Abraham. But I am the judge of all the earth. I can teach you about sin and make a promise about a savior. I can tell you about your family and what I, the maker and creator, have planned for you and this great nation to come. And the savior, the blessing I will make out of your family for the whole world. You think of all the little details that's, that are, have to be in place for Abraham to even understand the promises given to him in Genesis 12. That God is a holy God and demands holiness to be with him. But that God is also the giver of holiness through his son and one who makes people holy by his spirit. You think about how there's this order and structure in every truth of faith God's use and management of time, things that Abraham can begin to depend on and rely on and pray about. That's really the step I'd like you to think about, is all of this conversation and prayer or of faith, this teaching of the Lord, is giving something for Abraham to pray about. Just like we had a baptism this morning. I think you could come up with, because of your faith, you could probably write a decent prayer that would have mimicked the one we prayed after the baptism. Lord, thank you for this baptism. Lord, bless this child who is baptized and keep him in faith. Lord, help all of us to remember the benefits of our baptism and may we all be preserved in faith until you come again. You're just applying your faith to the circumstance. Abraham has an entire backdrop that the Lord has given him before we hear about the fall, the coming fall of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham has prayed for himself and his faith. He's prayed for Sarah and his family and his servants. He's, he's become a prophet in teaching and preaching who God is and praying in accordance with that. And I think we're not the only ones that probably do a when, when Lot says, I'm choosing to live in Sodom and we're told that Sodom is a place of wickedness. Our faith chirps up a little bit, sends the shiver down our spine, and I think a prayer goes up to God. That's a prayer. That says, Lord, please protect Lot in sinful Sodom and Gomorrah. And probably a number of other prayers that go along with it. This is the backdrop. And now picture as God, we're ready for the story. Picture as God takes the stars, the lights in the infinity chamber of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and places them in his hands and, and reveals to Abraham, this is what I'm going to do. And maybe in some way he turns the sound on in the room 
and says the outcry against this place is great. Can you hear it? It's like an alarm and a whistle unceasing in the ears of God. I hold all these things. I know all of these things, Abraham. Let me turn on the volume for you. Listen to the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah. Their sin has reached its peak. I hear it because I'm God. I know it because I'm God. And I care because I'm God and the judge of all the earth. You know that I care about sin and its shame that calls out to me from the earth. You know because you know that I'm a holy God. You know what they deserve. So Abraham listens and he hears this report of what God plans to do. But God didn't say, he didn't say anything about Lot. And Abraham knew that Lot lived there. Abraham doesn't know everything like God knows, but he does know that Lot lived in Sodom. And we know that too. Abraham had some knowledge. He, Lot lived there and he could see there's a light in your hand. That's the soul of Lot. And there's the soul of his wife and the souls of his daughters and their husbands. And he thinks, God, are you going to smush the book on Lot? On the righteous? Just like the wicked? Do you, do you treat them all the same? Is this who you are? I, I need to write a devotion for my family. What am I writing this devotion on? What you're going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah? But you have a righteous one there. I, we had a devotion last week, Lord, on the story of Noah, your servant, the righteous Noah. And when you closed the book on the life of the world, you spared Noah because he was righteous, because you made him righteous. He was your servant. Well, Lot is too, right? Shouldn't I, shouldn't I add the story to that devotion? Isn't it fair? Are you really going to sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Like, like sweeping your wedding ring into the garbage can with, with the crumbs and the dead flies? Are you really going to do that, Lord? That doesn't make any sense. You care about that wedding ring. You care about, this is your child, your child of faith. Will not the judge of all the earth who punishes what is wicked and rewards what is holy and keeps it close to him, will not the judge of all the earth do right? This is Abraham's perspective, and he recognizes that he's just the dust and ashes. I don't have all the info, Lord. I'm not God. I am far from it. Overwhelmed, to be honest, in this infinity room. But he makes a very specific and personal application. He wanted to be, listen to this, he wanted to be solidified in that devotion that he could give his family. And he asked God to spare the whole cities, all lame, for the sake of 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. Keeping Lot in mind. Counter that prayer with the truth that if God did snuff out the life of Lot, he would have been just he would have been a good judge, even if he squished Lot with Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot would have gone to heaven, like all believers do, and he would have been different and not just alike to all the others. God could have been sparing Lot from future temptations that would be more than he could handle. He could be closing the book on Lot's life and his family before they fell into grave sin and unbelief. He could be taking them while they were his children. Who knows? God has all the facts and we don't, we don't. But we operate with the word of God. And this is where Abraham still is so bold to speak. Because who among us is qualified? Who among us has all the facts and all the information? Who among us can, can ascertain the scale and the balance between God's holiness and God's love and where one meets the other as you deal with each and every soul? Who among us would get it right 150,000 times a day? Only God, perfect in his ways every single time. And that will be our praise to him on Judgment Day. 
And that's what makes this prayer so bold. It's not a prayer of unbelief. It's a prayer of faith, but it is bold. Lord, make this specific application of your mercy because I'm praying it for the sake of the righteous. It's a prayer with the truths of faith at work. Do you get how important that is? How significant it is? Not just that Abraham makes the prayer, but that it's a prayer that has nothing to do with himself. It is the prayer that has nothing to do with his own concerns or something against God's will. It has to do with the name of God and for the sake of the righteous. And God smells the prayer like fragrant incense. He is most delighted. Why? Because it's the prayer of faith. It's, it's a cycle that comes full circle into the nostrils of God. First it came out of God's lips in his word, a word that was Jesus, a word fulfilled in Jesus, promises made about righteous and the wicked that come true because of Jesus and what he's done for us. This word goes out and God gives faith and faith then prays it back to God and he can breathe it up in his nose and he breathes in the fragrance of his own son and those who believe in him and cherish those who are righteous as God keeps them as the apple of his eye. You can understand how this all goes up. So may we rejoice in our prayers of faith. Shame on us if our only prayers our eye rolls to God and grunts of frustration when we are not in the circumstances of life we'd like to be. Take this weapon God has given and offer it up to him for your comfort and strength. Prompted by faith, make your prayers and find your refuge in the name of the Lord and trust the infinite chaos around you to God. Tackle today's temptation and wrestle tomorrow's problems with prayer, praying prompted by faith in the word of God. And now we take it one step further and realize that God does more than just listen and enjoy the prayer of his servant. He answers. Without Abraham's prayer, the story's over and the headline is Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed, Lot included. Abraham prays for the sake of even ten, Lord, spare the cities. But the headline tomorrow is not the near destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, but God found ten righteous. That's not the headline either. Abraham's prayer, in a sense, is a, is a moot point because God didn't find ten righteous. But in the very next chapter, we read that God remembered Abraham and rescued Lot. Did you hear what I just said? God remembered Abraham and rescued Lot. Keeping the spirit of Abraham's prayer, even though the content was now moot, the spirit of Abraham's prayer in mind, God did one greater. God did his own perfect answer to Abraham, but he remembered. God didn't forget 20 hours later when Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. He didn't forget, what did Abraham pray about? He remembered Abraham and rescued Lot. Can you believe that God would take all of our prayers as individual and as specific as they might be like Abraham and factor them in to his governance? He doesn't just tell you about this is how I govern the world. He incorporates your prayers and the spirit of those prayers offered in faith into how he governs and rules the world. So often I think I don't pray about my breakfast meal or I forget to say, come Lord Jesus, because whether I pray it or not, the food is good to me. And I don't always pray, bless my sleep tonight, because when I sleep I'm blessed and I wake up and I'm refreshed. And I don't always pray about my trip here and my trip there. 
And you know what? I'm safe even if I forget to pray. And we can get into a little of the cycle of life and often enough, and I haven't prayed about that before and I haven't prayed about this. Why pray about it now? Things just happen because they happen. They just kind of keep going and faith gets cast aside and the manifold are your works of the Lord get thrown aside and prayer omitted from our lives. But you enter the infinity room and the maker joins you and he doesn't just speak he also listens and now i see how close he really is how low his ear how ready his powerful right arm and how perfect his answer God alone may be the only infinite one in the infinity chamber, but you stand in it by faith and speak to God in prayer. Amen.